The following is an Operation Podcast production. As much shit as I've been through in my life, I'm so grateful for the life that I have, you know? And I think that that part is just, sometimes you need to like, I, I don't want to say it, like, I, th I feel like the pandemic was a good time for a lot of people to really look, look at what they've done and what they want to do. And I'm here with Ruben. Uh, we are talking about live through love. And uh, today we're getting into sort of my path, uh, my creative process and uh, how to love, love what I do, love myself and love the people around me. Michael, thank you for coming in. Of course. Um, we're just going to chat. I want to chat about your love of life, how you share love with the world. And it's just the conversation. You know, we met just doing good in the world, right? It was a charity event. Yeah, we were raising money for um, oh, Ava's Kitchen. Ava's Kitchen. Yeah. yeah, and you were outside painting. We were inside the house cooking. I believe that painting got auctioned off that night mm -hmm. and all the, everything everything we did that night was for charity for Ava's Kitchen. And it was just, uh, it's cool because when you can pull creatives together to like do something bigger, like we often get asked to do a lot of events, like events, 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 events. And you never really get to see if like the money goes to use mm -hmm. or it goes to an organization. And when you work with an organization like that one that night, it makes you want to do a better job, you know? I, no, I just, yeah. I thought that night was incredible. And but, um, you know, the thing with that charity is that I don't, I get asked to do donate art to all kinds of things. And, and I have a few parameters. One is like, can I be there part of it, interact and actually tell the story? Cause if I just give art, there's no connection to what we're trying to do. Or if you just send a plate of your food, it's not the same view being yeah. there and being able to talk about it, but what they do with the money, uh, and this isn't a plug for Ava's Kitchen, but I just thought it was really cool. It's not about the research and this and that, it's about giving families the freedom to have their kid that's suffering from cancer have a day at Disneyland. Yeah. And I think that it's important, like when you're, you know, aligning yourselves with certain organizations that you do the research and you find out how the money gets spent because we could literally every single day go do an event that's quote for charity. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, a lot of that money just goes to putting on these lavish events and then it gets diluted, diluted, diluted. And so like a lot of my work and stuff that I do on the side is helping like the LA mission, mm -hmm. um, no kid hungry. Some of the organizations where, one, it, it's about feeding people because that's what I do for a living. And two, I can go be a part of it and do the work and see what it does as opposed to like auctioning myself off at a dinner and then the money goes to somewhere else. And then all of a sudden, like I end up in somebody's house cooking, which is also a vibe, but sometimes you don't know, you don't know what the motive was, you know? Yeah. And, and I like to just go be hands on. And that's why, like, I've been working with the LA mission for like eight years because mm -hmm. I can go down the skid row. I can make their job easier on the days that I'm down there and really help them feed people. And that's yeah. the part that like, for me anyway, um, that's where I like to focus. Like if I can give my skill set to something and it's purposeful as opposed to just that guy that cooks on television or whatever that showed up here, like to me, it's, it's my responsibility is to go and work. Yeah. And that's part of it. You are the guy on television, right? And hanging out with Guy Fiore and all these other cooks and, and with your brother as well. But yeah. it's, it's the stuff you're doing behind the scenes. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I, I didn't know what luxury was or I didn't know what hospitality was growing up. Like I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't never exposed to that lifestyle until I worked in it. And mm -hmm. I just remember like working in this, my first job was in a holiday inn, but after that I ended up working for like the Greenbrier resort, which is this old world resort and like the Ritz Carlton hotel company. And then I went off to work for like other like celebrity, like famous types, not celebrity chefs. That wasn't it, but like chefs that were the best chefs in the U S like mm -hmm. I wanted to go work for them. But I could see like our job was to make other people feel special, right? Mm -hmm. And when you start doing that and you see the reactions that people 
display when you do something for them, you start in your own head. You're like, wow, like, I wonder if I can do that outside of work, but also I wonder if I'll ever get to feel like that someday. Mm. And so for me, it was like, I learned because it was my job to take care of people. And then you start to realize like, it'd feel good if somebody would take care of you too. And so how do you keep that going? Like, and so for me, I, and I've been saying this a lot lately and, and other sort of, you know, platforms and podcasts and things like that. Like hospitality is, there's a lot of like hypocrites in this industry. You know, there's a lot of people that really just do this hospitality thing to get their name out there and, and that sort of thing, or they're cooking for themselves and they're not cooking for the guests that are coming into the restaurant. And it's like all this, like, you know, oh, they don't know what they're, I want my steak well done. And like, people are like, ha well done these assholes. And it's like, but that's what they want. Yeah. You know what I mean? So wouldn't you rather give them a well done steak and make them feel good because you gave them what they wanted mm -hmm. as opposed to making them feel bad for asking for it? Yeah. It's that easy to change somebody's emotion in that second. And yet so many people choose their ego over making somebody feel good. Mm. And I just think that that's really uh, contradictory when you think about the industry of hospitality. Yeah, and I mean, I went to, I don't even wanna name the restaurant, but I just went, it was a chill afternoon and we asked, for something with no sauce on it because Z doesn't do sauce. And they just straight up said no. Yeah. Like, and, but they're also, on behalf of that business owner, they're saying, no, we're not going to take your money. And no, we don't care if you ever come back to this restaurant. And and it's like, it's so, it, it's actually harder to put the sauce on the plate than it is to not. And yet the answer is no. Yeah. And it made Z feel bad left a, obviously a bad taste in your mouth, yep. pun intended. And uh, that restaurant probably lost a customer. And for what? They did. We Because they back. really wanted you to try their sauce. Yeah. You know, it's like, I don't want it. If I cook for Bria, my fiance who's sitting over there, um, she likes hot sauce on everything. And in the beginning, I'm like, all right, this is going to be a challenge. Like, I'm going to cook for her. I'm going to spend all this time and she's going to pour hot sauce all over it. Mm -hmm. But it became, for me, less about the fact that she didn't like the taste of the food that I make and more about the fact that she loves hot sauce. Yeah. So why would I not encourage her to put hot sauce on anything? Mm -hmm. And if she's going to, in my head, like mess up the dish, that's only, food is so subjective. That's only my opinion. Mm. If for her, it makes it better maybe I should try the hot sauce on the dish too and see if I like it, you know? And I think that that's that again, back to hospitality and like, you know, we have this word love. It's like, we love certain things. My fiance loves hot sauce on her food. Why would I be offended by that? You know exactly. what I mean? I'm just like, I should be stoked that she's eating my food mm -hmm. and that my food is worthy of her hot sauce. <laughs> Ooh, I like how you said that, but that's true. It's like, why are you taking offense? Why are you giving your power away? You made the dish move on. They're still eating it. You're nourishing them, but that is your art. And the art disappears when people eat it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's really dark when you think about what happens to my art. I'll let you all use your imagination, but <laughs> we have, you know, the new farm to table is manure to manure. Like that's not, right? it's not coming back anywhere unless they took a picture of it first, which is also like, you know, a huge part of it. It's like a lot of times, you know, in today's sort of visual society, people, people don't even necessarily care about what the dish is going to taste like or how they feel when they eat it. It's more about, did they take a picture of it before mm -hmm. they ate it? You know? And like, did, did they get the picture? And it's like, what if you didn't, what if the dish dropped in front of you and you ate it fresh, hot right there in that moment. And you just close your eyes and like, and I'll do it tonight. I'll go to dinner tonight. I'm going to Jose Andres's new rest, Jose Andres's new restaurant that's opening tonight. I will take pictures of the food. But for me, it's about logging like the memory of it and, yeah. and like obviously promoting my friends too. But at the same time, it's like you spend so much time creating these little things on these plates or these big things or these flavors or whatever. And then a lot of times people don't, they don't really care, you know? And it's like, for me, I'm always like, how do I make them care more about the dish and less mm -hmm. about, for me, sometimes they're more concerned with the fact that I made it versus how good the dish is, right. you know? And it's like, for you, it'd be like, if you, if you had to, they wouldn't want your painting unless they showed up and watched you paint it. And so it's like, do you appreciate my art or do you appreciate because the fact that I made a name for myself for my art, mm. like which one do you really like? Yeah. Good do question. you like this painting or do you like being associated with me? Do you like this dish or did you want to meet that guy that was on a reality cooking show 12 years ago? Like 12 years ago. Yeah, fair point. You know, and 
Um, for me, a lot of it was like, how do you get away from just, you know, I'm grateful for all those opportunities, but like for a lot of years, my brother and I both were just those guys from top chef. And we're like, we started our careers and went through everything the hard way. You know, we had to pay our dues and do all the hard jobs and still doing all the hard jobs. And it's like, it's just funny sometimes what people are interested in versus like what you actually are. Mm. And, you know, as an artist and as a creative and, and what you're saying right now really hits the nail on the head because that is your art. You want someone to experience it, but sometimes it's about, they just want to be seen for the scene and completely forget about the experience or the purpose of the point of what you were trying to create. Yeah. And, and I think that, I mean, that's great too, though, because like, not that that's great, but the ability to share all this information so fast, there is some value to it because mm -hmm. you, you sort of expand your net a little bit and you, you catch more people that would not have necessarily been interested in what you do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the real emotion behind it, like in the beginning, before all this visual sort of media was out there, um, it definitely was a lot more special. Like I remember going to restaurants when I first started cooking and if I had saved up like a paycheck and I could go eat at like a famous or fancy restaurant, just writing stuff, like asking the servers for like a pen mm -hmm. and asking for a disposable copy of the menu so I could take notes on the back of it. Mm. And now, and like to go work and then I would use that information to do research to, to teach myself how to do more things with the food that I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, like our, how transient our staff is because the information's already in their phone before the, the, you can look anything up. Yeah. You can look anything up. And it's so crazy because like every time I cook a dish, it's slightly different every single time because maybe the tomato wasn't quite as ripe or mm -hmm. maybe the fish needed to be marinated an extra hour because it was cut too thick, whatever it is, like it's always slightly different and you can't teach that part. And that's mm -hmm. why it's like all these books, chefs write these recipes and it's like the cookbook, the recipes never work. And you're just like, where did you get your cucumbers from? How much water was it? Like how much water was in that cucumber yeah. or like whatever. And it's like, it's just, I don't know. Also thinking about, I've never really, I've thought about thickness of fish and this, and but water in your cucumber, ripeness of the vegetable, like that plays a role in changing everything because it could be a little sweeter. It could be a little more bitter. It could just change everything. And sometimes you have to season a tomato with sugar. Like, you know, if you bite a tomato and you're like, that's not very tomato-y, season it with a little bit of sugar and a little bit of salt and taste it again. And you're like, okay, yes, I wish I was eating a riper tomato, mm -hmm. but the thing that makes fruits and vegetables taste more like themselves is the seasoning. Like mm -hmm. salt will definitely bring out the flavor of like spinach. Like spinach is very easy to over salt because to me, when you cook spinach, there's already a natural salinity in it. And then when you add too much salt to it, it's like, and it's like, mm -hmm. but I mean, I could talk about like food and recipes, you know, no, I hear the passion. Uh, yeah, all day it. because I I, I genuinely love, like we cook at home so much together now, which is not something that has ever, I've, I've never had the, the I don't I want to say the ability. I've never had the, um, I hadn't been far enough in life to where I had the time or the money to cook at home. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, it's like a very sort of daunting task. Mm -hmm. The grocery stores are super expensive right now. Yep. Um, and, and just the commitment of time that it takes to start a recipe from start to finish. But it's like, now that I've built things up in the company to where I have a little bit more free time to be home, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much I would love cooking at home, which is weird because like the last thing, uh, I, you know, a school teacher wants to do when they come home is probably teach, you know, after a long day, it's like, all right, kids, go get the books. Time for a lesson. It's like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that right yeah. now. I'm, I, that's what I do all day. But, um, and it was funny during the pandemic because one of my best friends said to me, he's like, I was like, Tam, everyone's at home cooking and everyone's now like a chef influencer or whatever because they're stuck at home. And he's like, yeah, and for you, you have to do it to like, keep everything current through all of this. Mm. So now you have to wake up and do your job at home. And I'm just like, that's pretty dark, but yeah, I can do it. Yeah, doing the work, practicing. So where did this love of food come from and cooking? And is one different than the other? Are they both together? I, I was a very picky eater. So yeah, I would say that the love of cooking came before the love of food. Um, I got a job when I was like 15 because I needed money. Like that came down to that. And so uh, I was busting tables and I wasn't 
you know, really that good at that. Um, I felt out of place. Like I had to wear like a white tuxedo shirt with a black bow tie and black slacks. And I had to go to like these tables and clean the dishes and talk to people. And I was a 15 year old kid. Like, why am I standing at a table? Like, what can I get for you tonight? It's like, I don't have that experience. You know, I don't have the experience to take care of somebody in that environment, but I could learn it. And then when I got in the kitchen and I was like, wait, you guys are going to let me like create this pasta special tonight. Or you guys are going to let me like be a part of making the menu or whatever. I was like, okay, this is where I want to be. Mm. Um, but I, you know, I moved, I was out of my house. Uh, you know, my, fa my, my father politely asked me to leave when I was 16 years old. Not, not that polite, like, but I was like, you know, it was, everyone has their stories, but it was like, okay, I love this kitchen thing. This environment makes me feel very sort of creative and stimulated and safe, but I'm also making money. And I like spending time here more than anywhere else. And so then I was like, how do I get really you know, good at this or better at this? And so then I, back then you didn't really have, I mean, the internet. And so you weren't, you heard about other restaurants and other chefs through other people that had gone and worked there. And so I just started doing my research and buying books and I was falling asleep with cookbooks open and waking up like at an hour before I had to be at work still inside those books and having to shower and get ready and go to work. And it was just like, I was like, I'm pretty good at this, you know? And, and I never think that I'm good at it or like, I don't think I'm a great cook or the best cook or whatever it is. I just know that it's gotten me this far in my life. It got me out of that situation when I was younger and like throughout my life, it continues to, to sort of take care of me. Mm -hmm. And so this industry where I'm responsible for taking care of others, this industry has taken care of me. Mm -hmm. And so I feel very, I feel a responsibility to keep doing that, you know, whether it be through the food we cook or through the people we train or mentor or some of the organizations we work with or whatever. It's like, I've had a pretty cool life. Like I never thought I would, you, somebody would be interested in me talking to them about my career as a cook or like interesting. my life, like your life is interesting. It's to me, it wasn't interesting when I got into it. And in fact, when we were all starting out when I was 15, 16 years old, back in like, you know, 96, 97, 19, this is 1996, 1997. Like people were like, yeah, you, you know, I figured you would end up in the food service industry. Like you were never that good of a student or this or that. And now it's like, Oh, you're a chef. Like everyone, mm -hmm. like, that's a really cool career. And it wasn't, it was only, I would say within the past decade and a half that that was common to think mm -hmm. that way. You know, I've been cooking already for 27 years. Most people like retire, like I think a job, a normal job that people start when they're in their early twenties, 25 years, and then you retire and then you start your retirement. And yeah. I feel like I'm like every year I'm starting over all over again. I'm opening two restaurants this year. Well, congrats to that. <laughs> but to answer that semi-rhetorical question, to me, it's like we met, we met how we were doing, what we were doing, and it's the passion. And I want to I want to share and showcase people how they are showing up in the world, living through love, sharing their passions, creating and giving humans these experiences. So the way you're talking about you and your craft, that's what, what that's what it's about. So I love that. I feel like to be able to really do it and, and, and connect with someone through that, you have to genuinely be interested in how it makes them feel, mm -hmm. not how good it makes you feel to get to do it. Yeah. And I think that a lot of people get lost in that. They reach a certain level of success and then there's this level of entitlement and ego and they have to protect that. Mm -hmm. And they forget what got them there. And I think for me, I always just loved the what got me there part, you know? and. And I, I still like that part. I like doing that part. I like to go to the restaurants and be in the shits and see the tickets shooting out. Um, and I just, we're watching this show called Bear on Hulu and everyone's like, oh, it's so spot on. It's so spot on. And Maddie Matheson uh, made this, I was very a part of the show. Um, and I'm watching this and it is spot on. You know, there are these memories of the tickets coming out and like, the, you're like, I'm never going to get through this. But when you do the feeling of that at the end of it, there's nothing like it, you know, and, and anyone that's worked in a restaurant and knows what it's like when the, when the ticket machine is, the paper's almost touching the floor, you feel hopeless. Like it's over. I'm getting fired. 
uh, or the restaurant's going to close or all these people are going to walk out, but somehow you figure out a way to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Or we have this saying like the doors open at 6 PM every day. Um, no matter how deep in the shit you were with your prep, for some reason we were set up by six every day, mm -hmm. somehow, whether or not somebody was still in the back, like doing, you know, peeling potatoes or whatever to get something done. It was like, it's six, the guests are coming in. We have to, we have to do this, you know, and that rush that you get, um, to me, that's, that's what success is, is getting to feel like that at work, not how much money you make or, you know, it's like, I could imagine, I don't even own a computer. Like I don't have a, a laptop. I have an iP iPad, which is a giant version of my phone that mm -hmm. as everyone knows, but I don't know how to use a computer. I don't know how to make documents or Google drives or any of that. I never, I missed all that part. Yeah, so you're not <laughs> yeah. writing your own cookbook that way. Well, cause I always laughed like all these executive chefs. They were like, where's the chef? He's in the office. Where's the chef? He's in the office. And I worked mm -hmm. in a lot of these luxury hotels and that's what made me, um, not want to work in hotels anymore because other than maybe one or two chefs that I'd ever seen while working in the hotels actually cook, those guys were always in meetings or always in the office or, and I'm like, that's, that's not the part that I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, I wanted to do the cooking part, the creating part and the like, I want to do the fun part. Yeah, yeah. And, and then a lot of those, you know, sort of people made the job look really boring. And I was, I was like, well, that's not, if I wanted to sit in an office all day, I would have a computer and wear a suit. Like, I don't want that part, you yeah. know? Yeah, so like maybe that. I need to try and get good enough where I can surround myself with people that are good at that part and want to do that part so I can do the part that I want to do, which is just be creative. And that's what they say. A lot of these top level executive successful people, they're like, do what you do best and then find people to support you. Like, I need stuff to help me with the thick of the stuff. Let me just create all day long, yeah. right? And trying to build that team and get to that point, you have to go through so many people. I heard that quote once where it's like, nines higher tens and eights higher sevens and sixes. And that really stuck with me. And I think I heard that when I was like 22 years old. And I was like, dang, what does that mean? Like, you know, if you're an eight, you got to surround yourself with sevens and sixes because it makes you feel good about being that eight. But if you're a nine, you want somebody there that you can still like, cause selfishly we want to learn from the people that we're around. It's mm -hmm. like, how, how are you going to get inspired if you're stuck in a studio every day painting and no one's bringing something to the table? Like what if, you know, a younger s s aspiring artist or s somebody comes in, they want to intern with you or whatever, and they have a good idea, you know, you can make a decision. You can be like, nah, that's fucking stupid. Like, why would we ever do that? Or you could be like, yeah, let's talk about it. And then maybe you get you get something in return. Yeah. And I know that that sounds selfish, but if, if you're attracting a certain level of talent and they recognize your talent, but they bring something to the table, it's your responsibility to be a sponge and figure out how to soak that up. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, we hire, we hire that way. Uh, I mean, lately it's tough. You know, you hire, you hire what you can get because no one wants to work right now. Everyone's figured out how to be creative on their own, which is great. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's incredible, but, but these labor job, these jobs that require people to physically show up and work with their hands and not have their phone out. Yeah. And that's what I learned during like the pandemic for two years. It was like, wow, I'm on my phone a lot. And I had this rule in my restaurants where it's like, when you're on the clock, you're not on your phone. You can't. And then everyone found this loophole. It was like, well, I'm using it for a timer, you know, cause we had to like, make sure you time that for six minutes. So they're like this and you're like, they're like, oh, I'm cooking the eggs. And you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Of course they're on their phone. Like, but it, so it's like creatively it got everyone, you know, these devices they carry around made everyone creative or, or it drew their creativity out because they got inspired by other stuff, but it also distracted them from just the work part. And I think that that's the part that people have to fall back in love with is like the hard work part is, is also fun because if you go through something like that and then you're rewarded at the end with a paycheck or somebody's happy about it or just the fact that you got through it, it feels better, you mm -hmm. know? And I think that I'm just a person that as much stuff as I want, I think that I appreciate it more wanting it than I do having it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go through like car phases and art phases and all these, it's like, I want to acquire this stuff because I want to see if I have the resources and the means to figure out how to get it. Yeah. And then once I have it, I'm like, did I really want that? You know what I mean? Like, did I need that car? I don't even drive it. Like, you know, it's like, I'm, I, I, 
I don't know. I just... You love the journey. I hear that this is what I'm hearing resonates. It's the journey, the journey, because I think when you get something handed to you, you don't appreciate it as much, right? Yeah, and as a person who never really got... As a person who never had that happen, like somebody just be like, here, you know, I always appreciated everything I could get because I definitely worked really hard to get it. Mm -hmm. Like I, you know, we had a saying growing up, like... I work more seven day weeks than I work five, you know, cause our week, work week was always like six days a week, 12 hours a day, 15 hours a day, 16 hours a day. And it was like, if you ever got two days off in a row, you were just like, like, I remember I was living in West Virginia doing my apprenticeship. I was 19 or 20 years old at this hotel. And I got a four day weekend, meaning the last two days and the first two days of the next schedule week off. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, cause that's how the schedules were written. I drove to Canada. It was like a 15 hour drive. I'm like, oh, I've got four days off in a row. What, I'm, what am I going to do? I got like 400 bucks. I'm going to drive to Canada because I've never been there before. And I just yeah. drove like just straight up to Canada. And it was like, you were, I appreciate, I, I'll, I'm still talking about it. And I've been on trips that I've forgotten about yeah. in my now adult life or a more adult life, adulter life. It's a new word um, that I don't remember because I didn't. I didn't have that journey. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't like stoked, you know, mm -hmm. but you got four days off. You, you, you maximize those four days. And yeah, I just went to Canada. <laughs> I know, well, that's something you obviously appreciated so much and deeply. So, so talking about all this, what is, what do you tell? It's not about the, the next chef or any of that, but the young creative, the future artists, the future us, you know, what part of the journey? Because I feel like most people are trying to skip the journey. They want to just get there. They want to be the overnight success. They want to go on TikTok and have a million followers. Yeah. But what are those lessons that like super stick and resonate in your life that you're like, I need to share this? I think you're starting to see it today. And I think it's this. I think it's that um, eventually that market's going to be saturated with the same people that did the same thing. And so then you're all going to be alike and there's nothing unique mm -hmm. about it. So for me, it's about figuring out your like, what's unique about you that makes you different. What are you the most passionate about? And are you willing to put the work into that one thing? And I'll, I'll use this analogy, like, or this comparison, actually, I really wanted to be a sous chef when I was like 22 years old. I, so that was the next after like chef de partie or line cook. Like I want to be the manager. I want to be the sous chef. And the executive chef pulled me aside one day and was like, why? He's like, you can go and learn how to do the management stuff in two hours time. Like you can, anyone can learn how to do that. It's mm -hmm. no different than managing a store or whatever, but you can't go back and learn how to cook. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, that's the part that I want to focus on. And that's, I think, what separates sort of the people that are authentic from the people that have really good lighting systems in their house and a cool tripod and and know how to mix beats together over a looped video of them making something in their kitchen, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, for me, the story is a lot deeper than that. I If I make a sauce and taste it and it's off, I'm pretty sure through my own internal research, I can figure out how to fix it. Mm. And I think that's the part that people skip. I say to those people, work hard, like do the hard part, do the hard part so that you can appreciate the easy part if you ever get there. Mm. And I think that for me, I never stop trying to do the hard part. There's a lot of times where we pull up to an event and we don't have anything to cook on. And there's a thousand people that are going to be there in four hours and you just figure it out. And you know, it sucks sometimes. Like it sucks. You, 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 you get dirty, you get tired, you lift heavy things, you, you do whatever you have to do. Sometimes so much so that people are shocked. Like, like if I'm just out there, like, what are you, what are you even doing here? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, this is my job. You know, this, that's what I'm doing here. And mm -hmm. my brother and I sometimes get into the only time we really argue and he's my business partner right now is at like three o'clock in the morning when we're, I'm obsessed over one dish and we're sitting in one of these restaurants that we're about to open and there's 20 other dishes on the menu and I'm fixated on this one mm -hmm. thing. And he's like, but we have a whole restaurant to open. And so we have that balance with each other. And there's that, sometimes there has to be some logic too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a tough part for creative sometimes is like finding the, finding the, res embracing some of the responsibility aspects mm -hmm. of it too. Or the balance with the, 
higher artistic point and then the overall vision and the experience in between. Yeah. It's like you could spend your entire day making merch and it would probably be a lot more lucrative than you spending your entire day painting because you can reach a much larger audience that way. Mm -hmm. But then the merch becomes worthless because it was birthed out of the, the creative process, you know? And, and so it was like, how do you, how do you do both? And then all of a sudden it becomes two full-time jobs and then three full-time jobs. And you're like, oh, but I want to communicate and do a podcast and that's four full-time jobs. And it's like, oh, I want to go do these charity events and it's five and it's six and it's seven. And people are like, wow, your life is so incredible. You're traveling all over the place and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes you're probably like, yeah, but I just, all I want to do is paint. Yeah. And it's like, and then when you get to go back to that, you appreciate it that much more. Hmm. And so I think that that's probably good advice too. It's like, if you get distracted from the discipline, then every time you take those breaks from it, see how you feel when you get back to it. Hmm. And if you don't like it, or you're like mad or bitter that you have to do it, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. Hmm. And that's, it's like exercising. Like I have a Peloton at my house and if I Peloton every other day and I get in this routine, yeah, I get super fit and I'm like, fine. But if I take a week off every now and then, I get back on it and I like smash the last record of what I did, you know? And it's like, oh, okay. Like I took a break from this for a second, mm -hmm. but then when I got back to it, I realized how much I, I liked it, I loved it, you know? And that's, I think that's the best way to really decide whether or not you love doing what you do. Mm -hmm. During those breaks, how do you feel when you get back to it? If you don't like to paint, then don't paint anymore. If you don't like to cook, don't cook anymore. If you don't like to sing, don't sing anymore, you know? Yeah, so like I, I take the family and I, we go travel. And when we travel, we enjoy the world, eat the food, experience everything. And I love leaving, but I love coming back. And then I love going right back into my routine. And I can't wait to painting it. Like I know that that's the passion. So exactly yeah. what you're talking about. That's why we have to do what we do. But also it's the, it's the hype part of it that actually forces people to like sometimes retire earlier. What, what, think about like athletes, you know, how many of them are just like, I need to look at Dennis Robin. You know what I mean? There was a point where he had to just completely step away. He's playing for the best, one of like the best franchises ever in the history of basketball yeah. on the best team with the best players. And he had to go to Vegas and take some time for himself, mm -hmm. you know? And, but then when he came back, like, did he love basketball or were there other things that he was interested in? But had he only been playing basketball the whole time and didn't get this like rush of all these other things, I, I wonder if, if that would be different, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And like, he's one of the most incredible athletes in the world, but his, his legacy is in how like different he was or, you know, how he was not like all the other athletes yeah. in a sense. And I guess that that's the part. And, but genuinely I bet he loved basketball. He loves basketball, but there's, and that's the part that's like, if you're so fast to want to be visually uh, present and, and noticed by all these people, that's the part that ends up kind of emotionally fucking with you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you have to, you have to want to go back to the, to the part that got you there, you know? And that's the part that's for me kind saying. of the most challenging, you know? And that's like when I was, when you do TV for me, it's like a balance of like, okay, I'll do blocks of television and we'll shoot a whole bunch of shows. And like, I'm so gracious, like to food network and all the, all of our partners that we work with. And it's like, it's this circle though. It's like every time I'll go do a show for a while with them, I'm actually really motivated to go back to the restaurant mm -hmm. and then I get back to the restaurant and I focus on that. And then it makes me want to go back to the show to show what I just taught myself back in the restaurants. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, it feeds itself. Yeah. So it's a good cycle. It's, it's wild. So you've been doing this for a really long time. Do you ever get burnout and how do you deal with it? I think I get, I get, yeah, I get burned out. I get overwhelmed because sometimes I'll procrastinate mm. because I, I have a lot of things going on. And so 
so what I'm trying to do now to prevent myself from getting burned out is, is be a, a little bit more organized. And I'm not saying like not physically organized, but mentally organized, mm. like prepare myself for things a little bit further in advance so that it doesn't, you, you create these perfect storms for yourself sometimes. And I think that as long as you can avoid that as much as possible, I don't get it bur as burned out now as I did, like when I had one restaurant Inc on Melrose and I was there and every single thing that went right or wrong was basically on me. Mm. And that was the part that like, I just, I was good at it, but that's what burned me out was having to deal with all the things that weren't the cooking part. Mm. And that stuff burns me out. If I could just be in a kitchen and have ingredients around me and just cook it and plate it and that's it. And that, that's the job. Uh, I don't think I would ever get burned out. Cause there's not like, it's, it's super satisfying. It, like it's really satisfying to see something finished. Mm -hmm. And I think that's in any project, whether it's a wall in your house that you want to paint. Like if you look at this wall, not you as an artist, but like somebody who's at home, like they just want to paint the wall green, you know, yeah. and they've been talking about it for months and, one day they paint that wall and it's like, okay, you bought the paint and you're stoked. Like you're stoked this now. Okay. I got it. I'm going to paint this wall in my living room green. And then you have to tape and you're like, crap, this taping part sucks. Yeah. Like I got to put the tape around the windows. I got to take all the, like the tape, the electrical sockets. And that part of it is like very tedious. And then the painting part and you're like, dang, I didn't realize how hard it was to like paint a wall green. But then when the wall's green and you're done and you set back and look at it and you're like, wow, I just did that. And I'm stoked. And it's like all that leading up to it. And that's, I think, versus like acquiring things. Like I enjoy the part of the work that it takes to acquire something. But when I'm working, seeing the finished thing motivates me to, I, so I guess it's the same thing. Like if I want to buy something, I got to earn it and like work for it and get it. And one day I got, okay, I want this truck or a car or whatever it is. And I get it and like, I have it and I appreciate it. But when you make something and you work towards finishing it and then you see it done, mm. there is nothing better than that. Like yeah. that part of it is just, it's just cool. Like it's just, it feels good. You know, mm. we're building these restaurants right now. And it's like, I know how much work it's going to take to get these restaurants done. And we're building one in Chicago uh, and we're building one up at Mammoth Mountain and it's like, okay, we timed them out so that there's a few months in between each one. And you know, now the clock is ticking and I know how much work it's going to take. And it's really fun. Like it's fun to, to talk to the designer and talk to everyone and like create the menu and start testing the food and like all that stuff. But this emotion that hits you like on opening night when you're there and you see people in this thing that you've created with this group of people and you feel like the energy it's life like you've just it's just come alive you know and you you get to feel that part it's like it's wild mm -hmm. it's wild what that feels like it's addicting yeah i could relate that to like having a show and then inviting everyone there and then you're there with the energy and you're having those conversations and they're looking at the art and they all want to spend time with you and you're just going through this whole thing. At the end of the night, you're exhausted. But during that whole moment and you look back at it, you just smile. You're like, Because well, yeah. you're like, they were here for you, yeah. you know? I mean, they're here for your art, but they're here for you. And that part of it, like, again, working at the Holiday Inn at 15 years old to ever have gotten to cook with, for, and around the people that I've gotten to do it with and for and around, I never would have thought, mm -hmm. never would have thought, you know, or all the other experiences that came, like I never was on a plane until, uh, I flew to San Francisco at like age 16 to go, uh, stage at a restaurant and look at going to culinary school. Like I never had even been on an airplane and now I've been into like, I don't know how many countries I've been to. I've been all over the world mm -hmm. because I decided to go to the holiday Inn and cook. You know, it's crazy. Like yeah, every decision leads to something at some point. And look, look where we're at now. It doesn't make sense sometimes though. Like the guy had the, you know, the 2.0 GPA and the, the, the kid that, you know, the notorious 11th grader that had his own apartment. It's like, but that's the reason why I, th because at that age I started working really, really, really hard. Like, yeah it just, you continue to build, you know? And I think that it, you need to make sure that the year 
next year is better than this year, you know? Um, and so I, I, I do that because I don't want, I don't want, I don't want it to go away. Like I don't want, I don't want the feeling of growth to go away because then you start feeling old. And I think that I'm not ready to be old yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 43 years old and I still think that I can do the hard work part for at least another 10 or 15 years before I'm going to be burned out from it. You know, Yeah. before you decide to hang the hat. Yeah. But then I think that's when I'll, I, I don't know. It's funny though, because you see people that are in your industry that have had this legacy and they're still showing up to these things. And you're just like, wow, how do they have that energy still? Cause I know how much work it takes for us to be here. And I'm mm-hmm. 20 years younger than that person. And then that motivates me. You know, you've got guys like Jonathan Waxman in New York, who's at his restaurant, like, and he, in his seventies opened up, reopened his restaurant in New York city yeah. right after the pandemic. And he's there. And you're just like, I know how I physically feel. And I'm just like, what, what vitamins is that dude taking? You know what I mean? Like I need some of those because it's his passion for and the that's game. what it is. Yeah. And that's what it is. So, so what's, do you have a favorite, favorite thing that you like to cook a favorite dish? I really, I like to work with vegetables a lot. Um, only because as a kid, I just didn't, I didn't like them. And so really, I think the number one driving force behind my creative process is like taking things that I don't like or didn't necessarily like, especially at the earlier stages of my career and making them in a way that I like it so that people that do like that thing, whether it be broccoli or whatever, they'll love it. Because Mm -hmm. if I can make myself like broccoli, then, and I love broccoli now because of like, I'll eat it raw now. I love it. But I had to, I, I, I had to investigate it. I had to like really dig into this vegetable and figure out, you know, the stem tastes different than the flower, flower, the floret part, and you can juice it. And there's a different bitterness that comes from that. Mm-hmm. And if you cook the juice, it's different than if it's raw. And it's like really investigating things down to their core. Um, you know, there, there, there's video, Bria last night uh, made this salad at home where she saw on, on Instagram, people cutting the cucumbers like this and then flipping it over and cutting it on an angle. And she made this like snake of a cucumber. And it's like this thing that's been trending for the past couple of weeks, trending like cucumbers, sliced cucumbers are trending. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then she made like this delicious dressing with it and stuff like that. But like the excitement that she had to cut this cucumber the way that she got to cut it inspired her to want to cook an entire dinner for me last night. Mm. And that's what's just so like, to me, rad about food. It's like, that one thing that, and that's why I love the, the social media part of cooking and, and, and the way people share this stuff it, it, because I get inspired that way too. Like I'll see an ingredient that I forgot about or like haven't worked with before or a technique that I've never known how to do. And what's interesting about it now is that it's so fast, this information so fast, so fast, so fast. But back in the day, like we had to go find that information, you know, I had to go to New York and make nothing and work in restaurants and then on my days off, go work in other restaurants for free and like do all that stuff to get the information. And I was just like out there, but it, this cucumber slicing technique that's been around for years made her so excited that she wanted to make a whole dinner around it. Mm. And I just, I, that, that to me is like, that's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I could imagine someone, being intimidated to cook for you, right? Some people might be intimidated to paint for me or whatever the case is. It's funny though, because there's no need, because I appreciate anyone that will cook anyone food. Like I appreciate that Mm -hmm. in them, you know, it doesn't matter if it's, I mean, if it's like horrible, I'm not, I don't, I can make a decision to eat it or not eat it. But like, you know, she'll say, Bria will say at home, like, oh, I'm so, every time I cook for you, I'm so nervous and blah, 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 But she's actually a really good cook. And it's like, and the first food that I was ever, that I ever ate that I was like blown away by was like my mom's like mom food, you know? And it's like casseroles and things like that. Like the first time I ever had like the chili with the cheese and the Fritos on top of it. And you're just like, what? This texture and this melting Mm -hmm. like cheese and like blah, blah, blah. And it's like, sure, it's ground meat and like sauce and chips that you buy in a bag and cheese melted and stuff, but everything together was like so delicious and incredible, you know? And it's like, that's to me, you have to be as excited about 
that Frito pie casserole as you are, uh, you know, a five Japanese Wagyu beef or whatever, yeah. you know, they, the, it's all, it's still, they can be equally as good, you know, imagine putting them together. <laughs> yeah. Grind up the, grind up the Wagyu. Uh, think, top it with cheese and chili. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I don't know. I think we would get can we would get canceled for that. <laughs> Probably for sure. Um, well, I, I have so out of curiosity, let's just say I'm throwing a, a live through love dinner for ten people. It doesn't matter, and I'm like Michael, I just want you to cook a love. That's it. That's the only rule. What would that meal look like? <sighs> Oh, I think first of all, that, that could be like, everyone's always like, what's your dream restaurant? And I think that that, that would look very similar to, uh, that dinner in, in, in my dream restaurant would be like where I can just go to this store. The environment's controlled enough to where it's no different than a dinner party at home. And like, I can just cook. So I have the time to like, like if I, I'm not, there's no time restraint or deadlines or it's, it's basically like get the best ingredients that I can get. Um, you know, our plates at home that we plate on are very basic plates. I buy them at bargain fair on Fairfax. They're white plates that are plain. And it's like, for me, when I'm cooking at home, I'm like, okay, I've got these plates that I spend like three or $4 a piece on. Like they're not expensive. I go buy cases of them at a time. If they break, it's unfortunate. I actually get mad because they're like my favorite plates, but it's a blank thing. And for me, I'm, I'm like, you know, if I can make it look beautiful on this blank plate, as opposed to this expensive China, mm -hmm. then, then I'm, I'm doing it. You know, I'm, I'm doing what, what I wanted to do, you know? And I think that a lot of times the food should look as good on a paper plate, uh, as it does on like a piece of Bernardo or Versace China, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the, the meal would be, my dream meal would be to where I, and I hate to say this, like I would have no one helping me and I would just, I would cook for 10 people by myself. Mm -hmm. And I, and that's easier said than done because like, let's say it's at your house. Well, if I were to do that, I would have to like prep everything at my house or at a prep kitchen, pack it all up, get it over there, unpack it all, set up the whole kitchen, cook all the food, plate all the food, get all the timing right and do all that. And it's like, it almost sounds impossible, but for me cooking, like if I'm at home making a sauce, I can adjust it as I go. I can taste it. I can throw it out if it doesn't, if it's not, if it's completely terrible. And we've had meals at home where I've been like, you know what, don't eat this. And she, Bria's like, oh, it's good. And I'm like, but it's not. So let's just throw it out and like, or, or, or let's try and fix it and turn it into something else and order a pizza or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, so if I can, it, it would look like that. And, and I guess I would probably have a conversation with you and with Z and just be like, what is your favorite thing to eat? And I would really want to have that conversation with you guys. And then maybe a couple of the guests and, and then there's times in the night where they would be eating or you guys are eating and you know that the conversation, and I wouldn't be blatantly obvious about it, but you would eat something and be like, oh yeah, corn dogs. Like I said, I like corn dogs and there's this like corn meal, crusted, whatever. And you're like, yeah, he was listening to me. You know, it's those moments where yeah. you can sort of surprise people that, that I think I love the most. And so if people were ever call me, whenever I do a small event like that, um, in somebody's home, more specifically, I always have a conversation with them and say like, what do you, what do you like? What's your favorite thing? Or if somebody's like, Hey, like my girlfriend, uh, really is a fan and wants to eat your food. I would ask the, the significant other, like, well, what's, what's her favorite thing mm -hmm. and, and try and make my version of that. Mm. And maybe even just write it on the, if she's like, oh, she loves peanut butter and jelly. Well, the menu will read like, you know, uh, charred romaine lettuce with anchovy emulsion and frozen whatever. And like you'd read through and all of a sudden peanut butter and jelly. And then the next dish and it's, she's like, wait, what? The, and those moments to me are like, mm -hmm. and then I get to, because one way I like to create, sometimes the hardest part is coming up with the idea. Like what, what do I make? You know, whenever you cook at home, whenever you're painting or whatever, it's like, what should I make? And then once you get into the process, it's a lot easier to execute. So yeah, I would, I would, I would like interview you. We would basically have a, an off air podcast about you talking about food. And then I would make the food that you would want All right. my way. <laughs> now we know when we have that meal come up one day, I like it. I like the process. That's all. That's what it's about. It's collaborative. It's creative. You're getting the information to do what you do. 
But imagine if you, if you were like, all right, Michael, I want you to come cook at my house. And I'm like, okay, cool. I call you and I'm like, what do you like? And you're like, I like beef, I like scallops and I like chicken. Cool, that's all I need to know. Mm. And then I show up at the house and it's beef, scallop and chicken, but all different in ways you haven't had it before. Yeah. It's gonna be a fun night, you know? And I, I get to challenge myself because I have, first I have a place to start, but second, I know like, I'm really gonna have to mess this up for like to upset you, you know? And so it's like, I'm gonna, if it forces me into research too, I think I appreciate it even more. Like I had this TV show that I used to do called Breaking Borders. It was with Travel Channel. And I used to go to conflict zones all, all over the world. Egypt, Israel, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Sarajevo, Rwanda, Lebanon, Northern Ireland, Kashmir, uh, the Mexican-American border. Like I went to all these places mm -hmm. And first I would interview people that lived there. Uh, we would talk about conflict and why they have conflict and what their life was like, what it was before, what it's like now, where the future is and all that stuff. But I would submerge myself in the local food culture mm -hmm. and I would force myself and I didn't have to, the producers never told me I had to, I'd force myself into learning as much as I could in the course of like two or three days, just by eating out, going to the markets, talking to locals, everything. And, and some of these countries like, like I'm in, like in Rwanda, like I, I, I know nothing about the cuisine there, you know, and getting to learn that. And then, and then cooking for people that live there and doing my version of their, of, of what inspired me while I was there and hearing comments like, wow, if you can come here and in two or three days, look at the food we've been eating f for decades and change it and do it a little bit differently, maybe our country can learn how to live life a little bit differently mm. and things like that. Maybe we can change other things that we've been doing for so many years. And, yeah. you know, there's, for me, I was just like selfish. Like I wanted, I was learning, you know, I was like, well, I want to learn this, but then I was like, I want to make this. But then I also wanted to see if it was good enough. And that part of it was like, it was nuts because you're, you're, you're in these places and you hear these stories and all you want to do is give them a gift. And sometimes the gift that you can give them through your art or whatever it is that you do can, can be most inspired by how well you listen. Mm. And that's the part that tripped me out. It was like, if I get to know people here, I'm going to be able to cook for them better. And that was wild. And I, I, and, and we did it, we did it in like 13 different countries. Amazing. And just the perspective, right? You're like, I heard you. I see you. I'm listening. I'm presenting it this way. And if they have the takeaway of like, oh, there's another way to do what we're doing and we can do it better. And maybe it's the love and creativity and everything you're putting into it that you got from them. Yeah. And that's really what it was. And, and there was, there was this emotional sort of reaction to some, and I, and, and that, that particular project in my career was one of the ones that came and went very quickly. Um, but I was, I was, it was the one that like, for me probably had the biggest impact on my career because mm -hmm. I had the experience to go and do that and do it well, but I felt a responsibility to, to not phone it in and really do it, you know? And that yeah. was the part that like, I never thought I would get on, like, like I said, I was 16 years old the first time I got on a plane and I flew from the East coast to the West coast. And I, I didn't, I never thought I'd be flying across the oceans, never, mm -hmm. let alone to places that are like as remote as say Kashmir, buying vegetables off of a, a boat under the Himalayas where some guy is paddling up to you and just selling it to you off mm -hmm. the side of his boat. And if you weren't on another boat, you weren't shopping for produce that day. It was like, yeah. you know, it was cool. I've seen it on a map, obviously never been, don't know if I'd ever end up there, but. And most people wouldn't, yeah. you know, but then you get there and you see this place where, you know, they've been sort of cut off from the world and they, they were forced to make everything themselves. Cuba's a lot like that. Mm -hmm. You know, you go down to Cuba and yeah. I, was, I was, I went down and I did that show down there too. And it was like the, the level of passion and, and just, just sheer intelligence that that was, I mean, just because they, they were sort of cut off from these resources, which to me, I think, um, you know, goes back to like the whole phone situation. It's like, they're incredible people. Like 
some of the best food I've ever had. Mm -hmm. The energy was great. And, and it was like scientists were, had a passion for food and opened a restaurant because they, they were allowed to own their own business. But for so many years, they were doing these like very in, like sort of super smart people careers. It was like, but there's this little Island where they just like figured it all out, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and for me, sometimes I feel like sometimes you got to put yourself in that mentality. It's like, if you didn't have access to all this information, what would you do? Yeah. How would you survive or how would you be inspired or how would you create or how would you find your significant other, whatever it is. Like if you were cut off from all this stuff that's in your hand and you were forced to put effort into it yourself. One, you're going to appreciate it that much more. And, and two, it's, it's going to be received a lot more authentically. I think. Oh, it's a great scenario to go through. I mean, I mean, that's probably, that's something that's worthy of, of like meditating through that. Like, what would this look like? How would it be? Where would I be? Who would I be? And it makes you realize that the shit that you I ever complained about was nothing compared to what it's true, back yeah. people actually and don't complain about. They mm -hmm. like it's almost like, yeah, this is our this is just how we've done it mm -hmm. for years. And and I was like, I don't know. I'm just so as much shit as I've been through in my life, I'm so grateful for the life that I have, you know. And I think that that part is just sometimes you need to like, I, I don't want to say it, like, I, th I feel like the pandemic was a good time for a lot of people to really look, look at what they've done and what mm -hmm. they want to do. And I think, and I say this in every sort of situation like this that I do, I think there's going to be a time where we're right now is the time we're being held accountable for what we did during those two plus years. Mm -hmm. And I think there's people that lost a lot and there's people that, built themselves. Like I, we met someone this morning. He was a server, a waiter, worked at a restaurant in downtown LA, uh, lost his job during the pandemic. Didn't know what he was going to do, uh, is passionate about vintage furniture, slowly started acquiring vintage furniture pieces, blah, blah, blah. And like cut to two years later, we went and met with him at, he's got like three, four storage bays full of like super cool furniture that he curated and how proud he was to show us everything. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he built this business because he had to, so he gets to do something that he's super passionate about, but was put into a situation. We all were put in this situation where you needed to sort of find your path, you know, mm -hmm. find your way out of this or help somebody else find their way out of it or help everyone find their way out of it. And he built himself this business for himself. And I was like, it's, it's the only, like, if I buy a dresser from someone from today, it's going to be, it, it, it was him. Like I bought it from him, yeah. you know, and just hearing his story made me want to buy that dresser from him that much more. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that, that, yeah, we should all, whenever you, one thing you never, I think one thing that I always complained about when I was working these hundred hour weeks is that I never had time. And I think that whenever I had time, I felt guilty for having it, but mm -hmm. I, made sure that I used that time productively. And right now I'm using some of that time productively by not being productive at all, you know, enjoying like being in love and having a relationship and, and actually committing time to that where yeah. before I committed all my time to just work, 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 work. It's like, I'm starting to realize all these things that I didn't necessarily have in my life. I'm appreciating them because I had time. Mm -hmm. Had some time to, you know. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful thing, and having the time to come in and join us and share this. Well, yeah, because it's like it doesn't matter. I can come here and talk all this shit I want, but if I don't go out the door and do it, then why? Like, yeah. and for me, if I hear myself saying this when I listen to this interview again, I'm gonna be like, okay, I said that. I need to go do that, and I think more people should and could do that. You know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily. Uh, different motivations for, for saying or doing different things. And mm -hmm. I think that ultimately it's, you know, it's, it's pretty simple to make someone feel happy at least once a day and find time or, or, or accept the fact that you're allowed to be happy too, you know? And I think that once you can do those things, like, I don't know, like, it's just like everyone complaining in LA, like, Oh, I'm so deli. There's homeless people everywhere and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, 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 but they didn't, they didn't decide that 
path for themselves. In some cases, maybe, but yeah. I don't know. Instead of complaining about it, what if? What if you gave, what if you walked up, you don't know who it is, but like one day you gave a hundred bucks to somebody and all of a sudden they took that hundred bucks and just used it to like rebuild their whole life. Like you don't know. Yeah. And so if you, you can't complain about the problem, if you're not willing to do anything about it, when's the last time you did something to go help homeless people in LA or like, mm -hmm. but it's like, I'm like, people are, are complaining like as if it's, it's interfering with their life, you know? And, right. and sure the city can do a lot more, I think. And there needs to be a little bit more infrastructure and, and, and legislation to help deal with, mm -hmm. to me, isn't, isn't sort of, it's not an inconvenience. It's a, it's, it's another pandemic within itself, you yeah, know? And it's, it's like, a human problem. it's like, rather than complain about it, do something, you know, chip in. And no, and just to that point, there's a couple, two notes that just popped in my head. People are complaining to complain and they want to commiserate and complain with other people. But instead of complaining, just be the solution to the problem. And it doesn't mean you have to cure homelessness, but what is one thing you can do? Have you ever like waved, wave somebody in in traffic here and just watch the look of surprise on their face. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, it's common courtesy. That, but that, that to me would be a challenge that I would pose to people, like put on people, especially in LA. Like next time you're out, somebody's like frantically trying to get over, just push your brakes a little bit and wave them in. And like the, the, like the look of surprise, like you just made that person's day. Mm -hmm. It's that easy. But instead most people are like, and of course I probably do it sometimes too. They're like, ah, oh, screw that person. Like I'm sitting in this traffic all day, mm -hmm. but it's like that it's crazy to me that something so insignificant and small has such a big impact yeah. on people. Now it's that easy. Mm -hmm. That's how sort of on the other side of emotions people are, are, are on right now, you know, like they're, they're angry. A lot yeah. of people are just angry, you know, and it's, and they don't express themselves or share their emotions. And it's true. It's true. The littlest things. But I've got my favorite question for you now as we bring this to a close. Been loving the conversation so f thus far. And just want to ask you, Michael, how do you define living a life through love? Uh, how do I define living a life through love? I think... I'm sure most people that you ask this question say this, but it's about, uh, it's about loving yourself. Mm. But I think it's deeper than that. It's, it's accepting the fact that you're good enough to love yourself. And for me, I feel like a lot of my life, I, 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 I get paid to, to take care of people. Um, but I don't know that you can love anyone until you can love yourself. And I think mm. that that's, that's the part that, um, that most, most people should, should figure out because, you know, like I battled, uh, uh, you know, certain addictions and things like that for a long time. And, and I never went to seek any professional help because I never wanted to feel like I lost the fight, you know? And so like LA, you move here, you get sucked into these parties and you go down these paths. And I mean, these things have been in my life since I was 15 years old, but it was like, I still like, I enjoy a glass of wine with dinner and I enjoy uh, the ritual of a lot of these things, but I had taken it to like extreme levels at a certain point in my life. And I just, I had to love myself enough to fix it myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably the best, uh, the best way I would, I would, I would answer that is that, um, you take care of you, you know, and, it, and once you can do that, it's going to be easier to take care of others. Well said, spot on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being open. Thank you. For no, I felt like this was therapy. Like I got it out. Yeah. <laughs> I got it all out. <laughs> no, that was amazing. You were in flow. The energy was there and the passion came through. And that's why like, I wanted to get you on. I wanted to, I wanted to share you. So where can everybody find you? Uh, I mean, I guess like socially, visually, like what? Instagrams at M Voltaggio, I guess. But, um, this year you'll find me at Mammoth Mountain opening our new restaurant and, uh, and in the, in the first quarter of next year, we'll be in Chicago. Well, let me know when that opens, because I'm coming by. Somebody's got to, like, we got to right? decorate the wall somehow. Exactly. We got to decorate go. the walls, so. All right. 
Thank you so much. 